my uh, my grandma when she passed away, my mom's mom. A couple years after she passed, I go to her grave about once or twice a year and sit there beside in the grass, beside the grave, and just talk to her. And uh, you say, she couldn't hear you, well, whatever, I still talk to her. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing her. What uh, happened? I got a grandpa I never met. Up there waiting on me. I think he's where I get my uh, talking of spirit from. Grandpa McGraw, I've heard him. And uh, I got another grandpa now up there waiting on me. Amen. I've got Pastor Hood waiting up there on me. And uh, I'm going to go home. Amen. Some people, man, they get so caught up in this world. Yeah. Home's where your family is. Home's are the one, the people that care about you know that that's what home is. And there's nobody that cares about you more than Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. One day he's going to say, come home. Yeah. And folks, when you get up there and we look around, it, it's going to be worth it. Yeah. yeah. Amen. It's going to be worth it. I'm looking forward to that day, man. Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn over to Judges chapter 16. People are too caught up in this world. There's a much better one to come. I'm looking forward to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Judges chapter 16. I hope to give you something from the Word of God that helped me whenever I studied it out, heard it. A very familiar portrait of Scripture you all heard uh, Samson preached on many a times, and uh, I'm not going to uh, read a whole lot for that sake, that purpose, you all know the story pretty well. Uh, look here in Judges chapter 16, verse number uh, 15, understand this, that up to this point, this is the chapter where Delilah is um, trying to get into Samson's uh, strength and figure out what makes him so strong, and uh and she's uh, she, she tries several times. He lies to her and tells her in verse 7 that if you get by me with seven green whiffs that whenever dry, I'll be weak as another man. So she tries that. It doesn't work. Verse number 11, he says unto her, if they bind me fast with new ropes that whenever occupied, then I shall be weak. And she tries that. It doesn't work. Uh, verse 13, he lies to her again and said, uh, uh, she says, Samson, you mocked me. You told me lies. Tell me where thou mightest be bound. In verse 13, and he says, if thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. So again, he lies to her, and uh, she believes it. Look at uh, there in verse number 15. She said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me where in thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words, and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. And he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head. Uh, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, he tells her. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. Verse 18. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines. Notice, it says, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, uh, you can see somebody's heart by what they do. The way somebody acts, the way that they behave, the way that they talk, whether they cry, whether they laugh, you can tell what's inside their heart by what they do. It didn't say when Delilah heard or when Delilah believed. It said when Delilah saw. That means there must have been something inside of Samson. I don't know if Samson broke down here. You've got to understand that Samson is away from God. Samson's with an adulterous, whorish woman. Samson's away from his family. Samson's in their own place, living with their own people. Samson is flirting around with sin. All that I know is maybe when our Samson began to tell her what made him strong, maybe Samson got a little bit under conviction. And as he began to weep and tell her that what makes me strong, what makes me mighty is my heritage, what makes me mighty is the hair that God gave me, maybe Samson broke down and it says she saw that Samson told her all his heart. And she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. He has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. She made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man. 
and calls him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him. I always think that's strange how that's worded. She called for a man to shave off the locks, but it says she began to afflict him. His strength went from him. Sometimes you don't know who's really afflicting you. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Verse 21, But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Let's pray, dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, for loving us. Lord, thank you for watching over us, keeping us safe, Lord. God, I thank you just for this morning, God, your people that have showed up, Lord, to your house. God, that have given tithes and offerings, Lord, that, uh, Lord, have praised your name, Lord, with their lips, God. And, uh, God came out despite difficulties or fears or anything else, God, going on in their life. And God made it a point to be here this morning, God. I pray you bless them, Lord, for that. And now, God, use me, Lord, just as your servant, God, to give them a message, Lord, that you gave me. God, to help us along our way down here in this life. Lord, we look forward to you coming back and getting us. And God, we'd be perfectly fine if this message didn't get to be finished. God, if we just heard those words come home. God, we're up there with you today. Lord, we love you. We thank you and praise you. We ask all in Jesus Christ's name. And amen. Amen. Samson and Samuel are very similar characters in, in your Bible. Um, they have a lot in common. I'm not going to spend any time on it. They were the only two men in your Bible to take the Nazarite vow. Samuel and Samson. Uh, both their parents vowed it for them. Uh, the Nazarite vow was supposed to be vowed by a man or a woman who never mentioned his parents, but both Samuel and Samson's parents vowed the vow before they were ever born that they were going to be a Nazarite. And I, I said this before, but uh, that means it must be okay for parents to commit their children to the Lord before the children are ever born. It must be all right then for parents to have convictions and standards for their children, for their children to live by them. Both Samson and Samuel's parents do that. They vow the vow for them. Samuel keeps his vow, but Sam Samuel keeps his vow, but Samson does not. And because of that, we're going to see that they have two very different lives. They have two different, very out two very different outcomes, very different stories. But we can learn a lot from the life of Samson as a child of God. He was a lot like you and me. Uh, he number one, he had a supernatural start. A supernatural start. He started out strong. He started out filled up with the Spirit of God. He just, from his birth, God's blessing and God's calling was on his life. You and I have had a supernatural start. A supernatural beginning, a new birth that's taken place. That's supernatural. He had a supernatural start. Uh, I wrote this one down. He had several slaughter sessions. Several slaughter sessions. And you say, Aaron, what does that mean? Uh, he had a lot of great victories in his life. Samson could go back through his life and say, hey, I remember whenever God delivered me from that lion. I remember whenever God delivered me from the Philistines. I remember whenever I took the gates off that city and carried them up on my shoulders. I remember taking the jawbone of that ass and, and killing a thousand men. Samson had a lot of slaughter sessions where he could go back and say, I remember getting victory after victory after victory. And I hope this morning, child of God, you can go back and say, I remember victory after victory after victory after victory that God's brought me through. Yeah. He's a lot like us, Samson is. He's a lot like us. He had a supernatural start. He had several slaughter sessions. He was sold out for the Lord. Samson, the beginning man, was sold out for God. I mean, he's a Nazarite. Before he's ever born, he, is, he is, has a vow and a consecration upon his life to be different, to be separated, to be powerful. And he's he sold out for the Lord. I wrote this down, though it's sad. Unfortunately, not only was he sold out for the Lord, but he also sold out for a woman. And because of that, he was sold out by a woman. But still, he, he was sold out for the Lord in the beginning. He also had a suffering, number, I believe it's number five, he had a suffering, or number four, I'm sorry. He had a suffering that led to salvation. We're going to see it at the end, but Samson does get saved and delivered from all this. And unfortunately, he has to bring the house down and, and kill himself and all the Philistines with him. But his suffering in the prison house led to salvation. You know what leads to your and I's salvation? Suffering. A lot of people are not going to get saved until the Holy Spirit convicts them, until the Holy Spirit draws them and shows them their need for a Savior. They feel the guilt of sin in their life, and then they say, all right, I need salvation. Yeah. So Samson's salvation is similar to ours. It started with suffering. And then he was saved. And I'll give you this one fifthly about him, how he's a lot similar to us. Samson had a supernatural start, several slaughter sessions. He was sold out for the Lord. He had suffering that led to salvation. And fifthly, he had strange seduction. Strange seduction. Do you say, Aaron, what were they? If I can put them very bluntly, 
The things that tempted Samson were honey and whores. Part of my French there. You say, what do you mean? Isn't it strange the things that tempted Samson? You're talking about a strong man that could kill thousands. You're talking about a warrior. You're talking about a man that could literally, with a jawbone of an ass, with a bone, kill a thousand soldiers. Take the mouth of a lion and tear it apart in two. And you would think he would want him a godly woman. You would think he'd want him, or even like David, you would think he'd just have multiple wives and be committed to them and, and build up a kingdom or whatever. No, he goes after adulterous whores and prostitutes. Ain't that sad? He goes after honey. Food. Food got Samson. That was one of his major sins in his life, was food. And we look at Samson and say, how in the world could you be tricked by prostitutes and food and honey? I know this, folks. You and I can be tricked and deceived and tempted with very foolish things. Yeah. He has strange seductions. He's a lot like us. He's a lot like us. And I want you to look closer with me this morning. I want you to look at, in his life, what led on his path to destruction. I want to show you three things. Samson's path to destruction. I want to preach on this morning the sin of Samson, just briefly. I want to look at his path to destruction though first. His path to destruction, three things underneath of this thought. Number one, he was a Nazarite advocate. He was a Nazarite advocate with a Philistine appetite. He was a Nazarite advocate with a Philistine appetite. You say, what do you mean? He advocated to be with the people of God. He advocated to be a child of God. But he sat at the table of the wicked in England. He acted one way whenever he's with his people, with his mother and father, and lying to them. By the way, he's going to be lied to later on. Children, be careful lying to your parents. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But he lies to him as a grown man. He ends up getting lied to by Delilah. But he advocated to be a child of God, but he, he lived in the field. He had a desire for the worldly things. And there's a lot of Christians today that advocate for Christianity, but they have a desire and a zeal and a love and a, and a hunger for the things of this world, for the comforts of this world, for the course of this world. The course of this world, we always think of a path. You know what a meal's called? Course. And there's a lot of people that are ate up with the courses of this world set before them on the table. He was a Nazarite advocate with a Philistine <laughs> appetite. I don't know what his path to destruction, what led Samson away from God. Number one, he was a, a Nazarite advocate with a Philistine appetite. He started desiring and longing for the wrong things. Number two, notice Delilah did not discover his secret. He disclosed it. Delilah did not discover his secret. He told her. He disclosed it to her. You say, what are you getting to? There are some things you should keep to yourself. Look over in uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. You're right there in Judges, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, Kings. Look in 2 Samuel chapter number 20. I just want to show you this quickly. Get away from Samson. Give me this thought. Some things you ought to keep to yourself. Uh, there's a problem with letting everybody know your business. 2 Kings chapter number 20. And that's good or bad. Uh, I preach. I preach against Facebook all the time. I do it, and we'll throw in Twitter, Snapchat, <coughs> Instagram, TikTok. Uh, I think I said Twitter already. Uh, we'll throw all that in there. We'll even throw in Pinterest in there. Uh, I don't know what else we put. No one uses MySpace anymore. The reason I throw those things in is for this reason: people love either putting their dirty laundry out there or all the good stuff in their life. I'm not. I don't <coughs> ignore the dirty laundry, but the good stuff. You want to know why that's not good for you to see? Because that in your mind says, well, why don't I have that? Even though you don't say, even though you don't say, why don't I have that out loud? That creates a thing in your mind that you long for, you desire. And you say, man, why can't my life be like that? We're going to look at the man Hezekiah that showed people in his house good things. Good things. This is his Facebook post. Look there in chapter 20, verse number 12. At that time, Bar Bar Baradot Beladon, the son of Beladon, the king of Babylon, sent letters and presents unto Hezekiah. This is the king of Babylon, this heathen, that are getting ready to know all of his business. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hey, I'm going to throw this out. I'm going to keep going on a random place with you all don't mind. I like, I like what's going on. Hey, this, this Babylonian king, they heard that Hezekiah was sick. He's praying for all Hezekiah. He's probably Hezekiah's Facebook friend. 
Probably. <laughs> he probably gave Hezekiah a thumbs up in life. He may have even shared Hezekiah's purpose. So all, all of his friends could pray for Hezekiah. They're not praying for Hezekiah. They're being nosy. Amen. 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 Verse number 13. This is all free. I mean, this isn't in my notes. This is all free. Now you don't have to pay for this one. Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house. He shows them all this house of his precious things. The silver and gold and spices, the precious ointment, all the house of his armor, all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet. He shows them all the good things that God's blessing his life with. Isaiah the prophet, of course, the man of God comes up and delivers the bad news. He's facetious here. He said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. Babylon. And he said, Why, What have they seen in thine house? Hmm. What are you showing them, Hezekiah? Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in my house have they seen, for there is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah the preacher said unto Hezekiah, well, Listen to what the Lord just said. Behold, the days come, that all that is in thine house and that is in thy fathers have laid up in store for this day, shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget. They shall take away, they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? And we'll stop there. I'll just throw this out there to you again. Some things you ought to keep to yourself. They're no one else's business. You know what Samson did? He gave up his secret. He gave up his uh, source of power to Delilah. She didn't discover it. He disclosed it. You shouldn't just let anyone in your house. But I'll move on from that. Some of you don't like that. Uh, be preach on your Facebook. Amen. But anyway, I'll, I'll keep preaching on it. I love you. I love you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. But number three on his path to destruction, Delilah did not discover a secret. He disclosed it to her. He, he made a friendship with somebody he should have never made a friendship with. He opened up himself with somebody he should have never opened himself up to. Uh, number one, he was an advocate, advocate of God's people, but a, a worldly appetite. And number three, what was the greatest <laughs> sin of Samson or the sin of Samson? You know that he, he, he loved women that he wasn't supposed to love. You know that he ate the honey that he wasn't supposed to eat. What was Samson's sin? What was his sin that made God the matter? What was the sin that finally brought God's judgment upon him? I believe this. I believe the sin of Samson was keeping God a secret. Keeping God a secret. You say, Aaron, what do you mean? When she asked where his strength came from, he publicized his gift instead of giving praise to God. He publicized his gift Instead of giving praise to God, stay with me here. The Bible says four times throughout the book of Judges in Samson's life, it says that in 1325, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him, Samson, at times in the camp of Dan. That's 14, or 1325. Verse 14, 6. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him, the lion, as he would a kid. 1419. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 uh, men of them. And then verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 14. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arm became his flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands were loosed from him. And the next thing he does, he takes the jawbone of an ass and kills a thousand men with it. You say, Aaron, what made Samson strong? It was the Lord. It was the Spirit of God was upon him. Four times it says, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. And she goes to Samson and she says, Samson, what makes you so strong? And he says, it's my hair. And it's my heritage. You say, Aaron, what do you mean? His hair was his gift from God. But he also claimed that it was his heritage. Look there in chapter 16, verse number uh, 17. He told her all that was in her heart. He said, There have not come a razor upon my head. There's his hair. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. There's his heritage. You know, a lot of people believe that their strength lies in their convictions and standards that they have. 
or their gifts. They think because they're physically strong, they think because they're a hard worker, they think because of their godly heritage that they were raised up in church, or because they've been in church for 50 years, they're relying on their track record of their past. They think that that's what makes them strong. Samson said, what makes me strong is that I, I, I'm talented. God's given me a gift. He's given me a physical ability. I'm a hard worker. I'm a hard fighter. And hey, look at the way that I was brought up. Look at what I did 20, 30, and 40 years ago for God. Remember what all I did back then? Remember the way that I was raised? And you know what he's saying? He said, everything that I have been, all my heritage, that's what made me strong. That's not what made Samson strong. And it wasn't the, his physical abilities. What it was, it was God that made Samson strong. Amen. Right. And Samson did not give praise to the Lord when the question came, Samson, what makes you different than everybody else? What makes you happier than everybody else? What gives you peace like no one else has? Samson blamed it on his therapist. He blamed it on his medicine. He blamed it on somebody getting feeling better. He blamed it on a, a child or a grandchild. He blamed it on his family. He blamed it on his job. He blamed it on his four-wheeler. He blamed it on his bass boat. He blamed it on everything else except for God. And he kept God a secret. And God does not like whenever we start relying on our own abilities and our own gifts and our own track record instead of Him. You know something that bothers me about our nation? I mention it all the time. But you've got to understand there's a, there's a difference. I, I only know of the nation that's here today. I don't know about 100 years ago. I don't know about 50 years ago. I can read books about it. I can listen to your testimonies about it. But I don't know about it. My generation knows nothing about it. But you know there's a lot of people that believe just because America was great a hundred years ago, that it, that's why God can't curse it, or that, that, that's why God's got to have His hand upon it. You know God's not interested in what we did a hundred years ago here in America. He's not interested in what, what went on 150 years ago. God's looking at right now, are the people that are in America, are they going to live for me? Are they going to tell others about me? Are they going to keep me a secret? God despises when we don't give Him the praise that He deserves. I believe Samson's major sin, or Samson's sin was keeping God a secret. Can I say this this morning, church, on the path to destruction, not, not that you are on it, but, but, but on the pathway to Samson's destruction, do you keep God a secret? Do you keep Him a secret from your family and friends and co-workers? Do your grandchildren know that you love God more than what you love Donald Trump? Do you, do you talk about Jesus Christ more and how good He's been to you? Or do you talk about other things? You want to know, I'm, I'm challenging you this morning. You want to know how I know that some of you never witnessed for God outside church, your family, friends, co-workers, loved ones? But you never witnessed for God inside church. You know, witnessing for God doesn't just mean giving somebody the gospel. You know you can witness it for God? You can say, Brother Aaron, i got something to say. Uh, I was praying this past week for something in my life. and I don't really want to say what it was, but I've been praying now for a couple weeks, for a couple months, for a couple years, and God showed me something out of His Word that He's all right, that everything's all right, He's in control. You just witness for God. You can say, Aaron, I was worried about something and God gave me peace on it. That's witnessing for God. You can say, Aaron, God showed me something out of His book. That's witnessing for God. You don't have to do it every Sunday. Morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Like I told you before, I've been coming here for over five years. I got written down my Bible the first time I preached here. It was back in 2016. I preached on a someone looking for you in June of 2016. I've been coming here for over five years. You know, as far as I know, for some of you, God's never answered a prayer for you in five years. That's a long time, man. I feel sorry for you. I, I do. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be facetious. I feel sorry for you, man, that God hasn't moved inside of your heart to where you, you don't ever cry or weep over it. I, I'm sorry, but I feel sorry for you. That's not my relationship with the Lord. That's not other people's any relationship with the Lord. I'm talking about witnessing for the Lord, Samson. I'm talking about standing up in the house of God and saying, I just want to say that God's been good to me and my family. Things aren't the way that I want them to be, but all that I know is that God has been good to me. Every once in a while, it's good for you to do that. Every once in a while, it's good for you to make a mess of yourself or a fool of yourself or look childish for yourself. I believe God is pleased with it. 
And I believe one of the greatest sins that's going on in America and inside of our churches, it's not pornography, it's not drugs, it's not Satan's devices, it's not technology, it's not screens, it's not prostitution, it's not alcohol, it's not tobacco. I believe one of the greatest sins that's going on in America is that God's people are keeping Him a secret. And you ought not to keep God a secret. On Samson's path to destruction, I believe his greatest sin was that he kept God a secret. And then notice this, it says he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. You know whenever you don't acknowledge God, He's not obligated to tell you whenever He leaves? And I believe there's a lot of people that God's walked out of their family, He's walked out of their lives, He's walked out of their churches, He's walked out of their jobs, He's walked out of their marriages, out of their homes, He's walked out of their lives years ago, and they wished it not. You say, Aaron, why? Because they never acknowledged Him before. And I know this, one of the saddest days in your and I's life is whenever Jesus Christ walks out the door and you don't even hear the door shut. And God walked out of Samson's life. And if you're here this morning and you're lost, this is your pathway to destruction. This is what will take you to hell is these things that led Samson down the wrong road. And if you're saved this morning, you and I are not immune to this. This path to destruction. But I want to show you also, I want to show you Samson, not just his path to destruction, but I want to show you his path to deliverance. His path to deliverance. We're all on a path. We're all going somewhere. Samson's path to deliverance. His path changes all of a sudden. His life is just, it started out good, then it was bad, 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 bad. And then all of a sudden you start seeing something happening in Samson's life where his life just slowly, indiscreetly begins to change. And you say, Aaron, how did it happen? Where did it start at? Where did Samson, where did the change in his pathway, where did it start? It started with grace. In chapter 16, verse number 20, it says, She said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. He wist not that the Lord departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did uh, grind in the prison house. Look there in verse 22. Howbeit, despite everything, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Mm. Old Samson had some spiritual road game. You say, what do you mean? Hair grows from the inside out. Samson couldn't see his hair growing because his eyes were taken out, but he could feel it. He couldn't see it, but that hair started growing from the inside out. God started doing a work on the inside of Samson, and Samson couldn't see it, but he could feel what God was doing. You say, Aaron, how does grace work? Well, the Old Testament law worked like this. Man went in the eastern gate and tried working his way into God. He came to that brazen altar and offered the sacrifice. That priest took the blood of that sacrifice. He took it over to the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the labor of the pool and washed his feet. He took that blood into the holy place inside of the room where the other people couldn't go. He had the manna there, he, or he had the, uh, the, the, the bread there. He had the candlestick there. He had the altar of incense there to pray, and he prayed for the people. And then he'd go back again into the holiest of holies uh, where the uh, where the Ark of the Covenant was. He poured that blood upon the mercy seat. And the whole Old Testament was man working his way in to get to God. You know what grace is? God starts on the inside of you and me. And we can't always see what He's doing. We, can't always, uh, we don't always know what's going on. But all of a sudden, you start feeling a little different. God starts working on your inside. He starts convicting you. He starts nodding on you and prodding you and working on you. And all that you know is you may not be able to see what's going on, but bless God, whenever you put your hand up, you can feel that something's different. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm getting ready to preach a little bit. I'm Amen. glad that we not only got a God that works on the inside, even though we can't see Him, but I'm thankful that our, when our God works on us, we can feel Him. Amen. Amen. Work. Amen. It's Samson's path to deliverance started with grace. And you know a lot of people, the reason why they don't ever get saved is they don't like letting other people in. People are hard-shelled. They don't want to let somebody in to their innermost secret parts. But if you're going to get saved, you've got to let somebody in. Amen. And child of God, I know that you don't like letting people in. I know that you don't like letting people into your life. I know you don't like people letting, in people, letting people into your heart. 
But if you want to be spiritual and you want to grow in grace, you've got to let God in. Samson had a work that started on the inside. It started with grace. His path to deliverance. I like that we can not only know that God's working on the inside, we can feel it. Number two, his path to deliverance was successful. We talk about how it started, but it's, it was successful because his enemies made a blunder. His enemies made a blunder. Say, so Aaron, what do you mean? Did I ask? See, the enemy thought they knew how to steal Samson's strength. The enemy thought they knew Samson and what made him strong, what made him weak. The enemy should have plucked out his hair, but instead they shaved him. And you all know what happens whenever you shave your hair, don't you? Yeah. It grows back thin. Yeah. What I'm saying is, whenever things are taken away from the child of God, he didn't come back weaker. He didn't come back worse off. Whenever God said, hey, Philistines, take something away from Samson that he loves, that he cherishes it. Whenever that was taken away from Samson, what he got back was so much more. And I don't know about you, but child of God, whenever the world tries to steal from you and your enemies try to steal from you and they think that they got your number, they think they, they've got you called, they think they've got you marked, they think they can defeat you and Satan thinks he can defeat you. It doesn't matter what Satan takes away from you. For the child of God, we're not defeated. We're not lame. We're not, we're not dead. We're not dying. We're not, we're not discouraged. Hey, whenever you take something away from the child of God, he or she always comes back stronger. Amen. And thicker. You can take away our freedoms. You can take away our life. You can take away our health from us. You can take away our heritage. You can take away our hair. You can take away anything you want from us. But you cannot bind us to become the what's inside of us. You can't put us in prison. We're still free. Yeah. You can't lock us down. We're still free. You can't shut us up. We're still free. That old song that I sing, I can't sing it, but I'm going to sing it anyway. Like, man. Lock. Me up in a prison and throw away the key. Amen. Take away the vision from these eyes that now, now can see. Deprive me of the food I eat and even bind my hands and my feet for as long as I know Jesus. He said that I could still go free. He said that I, that I could still go free. Yeah. Amen. What kind of man would reach down his hand and do this for me, yeah. just for me. Yeah. I was unworthy to live and not fit to kill. Yet a man on the cross put me in his will yeah. and said that I could still go free. I don't know about his path to deliverance. It was successful because his enemies made a blunder. Number three, notice what he saw on his path to deliverance. Notice what he saw. Chapter 16, verse number 21. The Philistines put out his eyes. Brought him down to Gaza. Samson can't see anymore. You know what Samson can't see? He can no longer see the honey and the women. Those things that tempted Samson. Those things, man, that used to draw Samson in. Those things that used to hurt Samson. Those things that used to leave him feeling guilty and defiled and dirty and unclean and used to break his fellowship with God. God removed all those temptations from Samson. You know something I know about God, child of God? I know this. God said He'd make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And I'm thankful for the temptations that God just seems to remove out of your and I's life. What could have been a cursing to Samson, what could have been a, a, a burden to Samson is really a blessing because God's making a way for him to get out of temptation. And once his eyes were taken out, he was able to get his focus right. In verses 28 through 30, he's calling out to God now for strength. In, chapter, in verses 28 through 30, he's calling out to God to strengthen him for the first time in his life. 
He got his vision for the first time. God sadly somehow has to take away things from you and I. Notice the things that he saw on his path. Notice what made his path to deliverance successful. Notice where it started. Notice fourthly, God used Samson's enemies to shape him. I have two more points. Stay with me. God used Samson's enemies to shape him. You say, what do you mean? While Samson was working for the Philistines, God was working on Samson. Yeah. Yeah. While Samson was working for the Philistines, God was working on Samson. Samson broke his Nazarite vow and he had to go through the cleansing process as described back in Numbers chapter 6. He had to shave his head off of two turtle doves or pigeons, a male lamb, a female lamb, and a ram. But the problem is Samson didn't have a razor, but the Philistines did. Samson didn't have an offering to bring, but the Philistines did. You know, in order for God to use us, sometimes He has to clean a whole lot of things out. And He'll often use our enemies to do it. I don't know who your enemies are. I know some of them are. The world. The world's your enemy. People at work. The course of this world. Co-workers, friends, family. Uh, the world, the flesh. Your flesh sins that you have. That's your enemy. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil's your enemy. I know this. God uses your and I's enemies to shape us. To cleanse us. In order for God to use us, He has to clean out a whole lot of things like pride, bitterness, hatred, misplaced zealousness, discontentment, worldliness, and He often does so with our enemies. You know, His enemies wouldn't have the upper hand forever. Their day was coming. See, they brought Samson out for sport. Samson brought them down with stones. They brought Samson out for sport. Samson ends up bringing them down with stones. Amen. You know, we have a great stone. Yeah. And he's coming down one day. Amen. He's actually called the chief cornerstone. You say, Aaron, I didn't know that there were offices in the stone world. There are. He's the chief of them. It must be a tribe. I don't know. But anyway, he's the chief cornerstone. And he's coming. But folks, God uses you and I in the hands of our enemies. He uses that to shape us. The reason why you struggle with sin is because God's trying to clean it out well of you. The reason why you struggle is that He's trying to get you to rely on Him. The reason why you have people that mock you, that make fun of you, that don't listen to you, and don't listen to what you say about the gospel, about the word of God. God's trying to shape you and mold you and I for His service. So that's His, that God's using His enemies to shape them. I want to look lastly at the summation or the end, the summation. On His path to deliverance. The summation of His path to deliverance. How did Samson's life end? Samson, at the end of his life, was more like Jesus than he was in the beginning. At the end of Samson's life, stay with me, I've got a few, few more minutes here, I'm almost done. He was more like Jesus in the end of his life than he was in the beginning. At the start of his life, he was pro his birth was prophesied of like Jesus. He was sanctified from his birth like Jesus was, or had, had offerings brought for him. The angels spoke to his parents like they did Jesus. He was strong like Jesus was. He was tempted by the three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, and the uh, pride of life like Jesus was by the devil in uh, Matthew 4 and Luke 4. His brethren, and we didn't read it, but his brethren tried to deliver him to his enemies in chapter 15, verse 13. So the start of Samson's life, he's a lot like Jesus. But by the end of his life, he's more like Jesus than he ever has been. You say, Aaron, how? He was betrayed by silver by someone he loved. He was betrayed by a kiss, like Judas. He was captured, he was mocked, he became a joke to the world. Most people make jokes about Jesus Christ. He was beaten, he was bound up, he was stripped down. His hair was viciously removed from him. He was led as an animal to the slaughter. He became sinful. Jesus Christ didn't become sinful, he just became sin. He became a sacrifice for sin. Samson's death was suicidal and tight because he knowingly ended his life. Samson died as one of the wicked, with the wicked. Jesus Christ died as a sinner, with sinners. He got a shortened life. He died in the prime of his life. He died with his enemies around him. In his death, he looks up toward heaven and prays to God. Samson's family and friends come to get his body and bury him after the traumatic event. Samson dies with his arms stretched out between two objects. Two pillars instead of two beams of wood. He calls the stones to fall. Jesus Christ one day going to call the stones to fall. 
He destroyed more of his enemies in his death than he did his life. The enemy that thought they had him, but he had his enemy. He died, but got back up again. His body was resurrected from the rumble. His body was cleared out from the rocks, the stone, laid over, laid over top of Jesus Christ's tomb. He needed a sacrifice, so he offered himself. You know, God needed a sacrifice, so he offered himself. Samson was more like God at the end of his life than he was in the beginning. You say, what are you saying? You and I have such a misconception of the grace of God. We love the idea of all things work together for good, and then we love God, and then we're called according to His purpose, but we owe it. We don't like the next verse. We don't talk about it. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. You say, what's the image of Jesus Christ that you and I get? It's a, it's a sacrificial image. It's an image of death. It's an image of being a, an offering for sin. It's, a, it's an image of going the extra mile with people. It's the image of being spit on and ridiculed and made fun of and laughed and stripped down and mocked and not believed. It's, it's an image of pain and misery and sorrow. That's the image that God is trying to get you and I to be like. And you and I think that if everything's going right, then God must be with us. And you and I think if our health is good, then God must be with us. And if everyone's coming out to the church house, then God must be with us. But that's not the image of Jesus Christ that the Bible paints. Hebrews 11 mentions Samson's name and other men, and then in Hebrews 12, he says, all right, get our eyes off of everyone else and look at what Jesus went through. You notice what it talks about in Hebrews 11? It talks about all the things that those people went through that were bad. And then he says, now let's consider Jesus Christ and all that he went through. And folks, you and I think that it's all supposed to be good and lovey-dovey, but folks, I'm telling you this, you want to know why God's allowing your country to fall apart? You want to know why he's allowing your family to fall apart? You know why he's allowing your health to fall apart? He's trying to make you more like him at the end of your life than what you ever have been. God is molding Samson to be more like his son and a greater picture of his son, Jesus Christ, a better image of his son. He's using his enemies to do it, to make him more like Jesus. And I ask this question this morning, church, do you want to be like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus. I want to look like Jesus. I want to be the image of His Son. For God to do that, He has to mold us and make us like that. Yeah. And God uses our enemies to do that. You know something that's unheard of, but it, people do do it. You ought to get to the place where you thank God for your enemies. You thank God for the discouragements that you have. You thank God for unanswered prayers. You thank God for bad health. You thank God for people that mock you. You thank God for, 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 for sins that you can't convict. You want to know a good way to get past your sin? The Bible says laying aside every weight of sin. It didn't say get rid of the sin. It said lay it aside. Kind of the intentions of you might end up bringing it, picking that back up. I don't know. You know what I said to God a long time ago, a couple of years ago? I said, God, there's some sins that I can't get a picture over. But God, I'm not going to let those sins get me out of church. Okay. I'm not going to let those sins... Make me think I'm, I'm defeated. God, I, I just can't get victory over right now, but I know a day's coming. Whenever you will give me victory over, God, thank you for those sins now that I can't even get victory over. That's Christianity. Whenever you can thank God for putting you in bondage, for taking out your eyes, for shaving your head, for taking all those things away from you, and saying, God, I understand you're trying to make me more like your son. Maybe tonight or today or this morning, you can thank God for that. You can say, God, thank you. I know it's just part of the path to deliverance. Maybe this morning you can determine that you're not going to keep God a secret in your life. Maybe this morning you want to get off the path to destruction as a sinner, as a saint, I don't know, and get on the path to deliverance. Maybe you just want to thank God and say, God, thank you for putting me on the path to deliverance. Thank you, God, for that grace inside of my heart. Thank you, God, for the strength that you give me. Thank you, Lord, for shaping and molding me. Thank you, God, for what I can see now. Thank you, God, for making me into that image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Everybody can stand. Sister Ruth will come forward. We'll give a song.